in town and the king said to them, and I'm paraphrasing, go find out where he's at. Whenever you find out, bring word back to me so that I too can go and worship him. And then they were warned of God in a dream. And, and so Herod had all the babies two years old and un younger killed. That again was an attempt to stop God's promise from being fulfilled. So that's what this is. I don't, I don't want you to lose sight of that. We're going to, Sunday morning, we're going to go, we're going to go to Mount Carmel on Sunday morning. And, and whenever we start into that message, we're going to reflect back to this for a moment. And you'll see how all of that ties in, but let me get you back to your paper. Here we're told that the city was perplexed when the decree was made public. The Jews went from having somewhat of a comfortable life with Esther as queen and Mordecai sitting in the king's gate to now finding themselves under a death sentence that was irreversible. Now, if you are the average Jew living in the Persian Empire, you've heard nothing concerning God's intervention. You've been praying and waiting to see his hand, but you have seen nothing. As you listen to the talk on the street, you hear many different stories as different rumors are spread. You are confused as to what is actually happening. Some say one thing and others say something else. Fear has swept through the entire Jewish population. And the people are, des are desperately, it should say, searching for answers. God, however, is silent. For you and I, we don't see that silent end because, like I said, what the Spirit of God's taking us in where the action is. But for the average Jew on the street, he doesn't have the privilege that we do. So, and I think it's good to... to stop and think about what's that average Jew feeling? What's that? Have you ever been in one of those situations where there's been a, a, a need and, and something that was unforeseen has come up all at once on one day, life changed and you've been praying and you've been looking for answers, but you don't see anything. It's like God is silent. There is no movement that you are aware of. Let me go back here. As one writer put it, you would feel like a swimmer on a lake who went for a swim, and when he reached the middle of the lake, the dense fog set in. And he cannot see, should say, he loses sight of the shore. He swims one way and stops, and he swims another way and stops. He cannot determine the correct way to safety, and now the sun begins to set. Darkness is quickly taking over the lake, fear and panic begin to take over the mind. We've all been that swimmer on the lake at one time or another. That's where these Jews were at that time. Watch this. This is most likely how many Jews felt. They wondered, where's God? What they did not know was he was behind the scenes in the palace working, working his will so that he would be glorified and the Jews would be preserved, but they didn't know that. Here's the application. We are sometimes like the swimmer on the lake because there are times in the tests and the trials when God is silent. You know, it feels like we're in a fog at times. You don't know which way to go. You don't know where to turn. You can't, you can't get an answer. You stop and you listen and you are quiet and there is nothing. Watch this. It's then that we must be sensitive to his small workings. Small workings like a king who cannot sleep or a king who requests to hear the book of the records read to him, or the reader turning to a page on which Mordecai's intervention is manifest. Sometimes we're caught up looking for major events which reveal God's hand, but many times he's seen in the small events working in the lives of individuals. Today, as we step back into our study of Esther, we're privileged to be invited to the second banquet which Esther has arranged for the king and Haman. But keep this in mind, the average Jew doesn't know this is going on. He doesn't know. As far as he knows, he doesn't see the hand of God. And I, and I point all of that out to you because I think it's very important for us to understand that there are times whenever it's silent on our end, there's times whenever we don't see anything happening, but that doesn't mean God's not at work. It doesn't mean that there's not a king that can't sleep or a king that wants to, to hear the book of the records, or it doesn't mean that there's not a book open to a specific place. And I use all of those to say it doesn't mean God's not working somehow, some way, somewhere in ways that we are completely unaware of. God never abandons us. 
He never abandons us. Remember this, and I've told you over and over again, so I'm sure you've not forgot this, that we are here to glorify God. And so our lives are to be surrendered over to him. We're to present ourselves as living sacrifices to him and let him do as he pleases so that he will be glorified. And that, along with that goes the, the idea that there will be times when it's silent. There will be times when it's quiet, when it doesn't look like anything's happening. There was a lot happening here. There is a lot happening at times and we don't realize it in our lives. So tonight we go to the palace. So let us go and have a seat in the palace tonight and listen and watch the first point, Esther's resolve. Watch verses one and two. So the king and Haman came to the banquet was set with Esther, the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition, queen Esther? and it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to half of the kingdom. This is the third time he's asked this question. Remember the first time that she came into his presence, he asked. Then she said, come to the banquet. And he came to the banquet and he asked, uh, he asked again. And now here we are at second banquet and he asks again. Back to your paper. Let me give you some thoughts to consider here. As Haman comes to the banquet, He's not worried about the king's wrath. Haman had the gallows built, but he had not yet asked for, asked the king for permission to execute Mordecai. Now that he knew how the king felt about Mordecai after his exaltation, that was in chapter six, he would need to wait to seek his revenge. As for now, he did not see any real danger from the king because the king did not know what he had been planning. He would simply let his current plan slide by and get his wish when the decree would be carried out. Since Mordecai was a Jew, he would not be able to escape the death sentence because it was irreversible. So deep down, he is sad that he cannot hang Mordecai, but at least he's had, he, he had this banquet to look forward to where he could get his ego built back up again. Now the spotlight shines on Esther. It was time. Her request had been postponed twice before, but now it was time to speak up. That brings to mind a couple verses that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. It says this, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. She knew the difference in the two. She knew when to be silent and she knew when to speak. This was her time. But I want to tell you something. The, her heart's in her throat. You'll see that as we go through this. Whenever you stop and you consider what she's about to say, to you and I, it's, it's just an accusation, but to her it is not, as you shall see. Watch this. Now was Esther's time to speak. The Lord had somehow, somehow silenced her in the previous two opportunities, but now the time for great courage had come. The king has been charmed and now and is now curious, and Mordecai has been exalted. God has opened the door. He's opened the door for her. Here's the application. Watch this. We can clearly see the reason why God had silenced Esther previously. She went into her meetings with the king with her spiritual radar finely tuned. Now she shall reap the rewards of exercising discernment. Let us be sure we also have a spiritual radar, our, our spiritual radar finely tuned to listen to the spirit. There are times when silence is golden. There are times when the truth must be spoken. Balance is the key. And the balance rests upon the timing of God. I've heard believers speak when they should have been silent. I've been one of those who should have been silent. I've also listened when the truth should have been proclaimed and there was nothing but silence or words with no eternal significance. I will say that many people will use the excuse it is not the right time to proclaim the truth because they're afraid of what the reaction of others will be. This excuse is often used until all opportunities vanish. Then there is regret and often sorrow. Notice the words of an unknown writer on Esther's opportunity, and I quote, The king has already two other times, the, the king has already two other times when she first approached him and he held out his scepter and then at the first banquet. But Esther never answered him because the time wasn't right. 
Esther had a sensitive ear, a wise heart. She sensed something wasn't quite right, so she didn't push it. She knew when to act and she knew when to wait. Is, are you as sensitive as that? Do you know when to listen? Do you know when to speak up? When to keep quiet? Do you know how much to say as well as when to say it? Do you have the wisdom to hold back until the right moment? Unquote. I wish I could answer yes to every one of those, but I think we've all been in a place where we've put our foot in our mouths, haven't we? Like Peter, I heard Peter referred to one as the, you could tell Peter he was the apostle with a mouth shaped like a foot. Uh, we've all been there at times, speaking whenever we should have been silent. Esther had discernment, but I can assure you her Hearts beating clear up in her throat. Watch verses 3 and 4. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Back to your paper. The second part of verse 4 could read as follows. If we had been sold only as slaves, and I would never have burdened the king with our hardship. Esther trusts in the Lord, but at the same time, she's very careful to show great respect unto the king. She does not want to be an offense to the king. She carefully avoids the details that the decree was issued in the king's name. She could have brought this up, watch it, in Esther 3.12, but she never does. Here's what the verse says. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded the king's lieutenants and the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. She could have said to him, you know what? We are under a death sentence because you gave up your authority. She didn't do that. She did not do that. She never brought this up. There was no need to bring this up. There was no need to attack him. She needed to keep him in a position where he showed favor to her. So she was very careful. Watch this. She never mentioned this because she's careful not to offend the king. Watch verses 5 and 6. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, the one that has put you under the death sentence? And where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Back to the top of page four. The king had no idea that Haman, that Haman was a traitor and an enemy. That's what she reveals here. Esther exposes Haman as a traitor who had been deceiving the king. When it's revealed to the king, Haman is horrified. This man goes from honored to humbled, now to horrified, and he will go on to be hanged. This all happened within 24 to 36 hours. There are two points concerning Esther that I want you to see here. Number one is this, and that is her courage. You don't think about it too much. You just read through this and you say, well, she brought up the truth. She did, but there's more to it. Watch this. The words of Esther are a manifestation of the woman's courage. She says what needs to be said. This was not just any accusation. This was not an accusation against the average Persian in the Persian Empire. This is a statement that has just exposed the prime minister of the Persian Empire. This was the man whom the king trusted. This was the king's right-hand man. The king, however, trusted the words of, of Esther when she spoke against the prime minister. Let me tell you that God was at work. You don't walk into royalty like this and say, hey, here's what I want you to know. Your right-hand man, your prime minister is a traitor and expect it to be accepted. That's just, that, that's not normal. He would want more evidence. 
He would want to push back a little bit because this was a man that he trusted. And to reveal that he is a traitor really uh, shames the king for not vetting this guy far better for the position. But she exposes him. And God works in the king's heart again, and he accepts her words right away. That There's God at work again behind the scene. Let me go on. Let me read that line again. The king, however, trusted the words of Esther when she spoke against the prime minister. I point this out because there would be many a person who, if they were king, would defend Haman. There would be many that would have defended him. What are you talking about? This is a guy that I picked. I know his character. I know what he's like. He would not do this. Watch the application. We see this all the time today. We see one politician exposed for his wickedness, and those around him of the same party defend him and make excuses for him. It takes great courage to expose a person who is in a high position. Great courage. That's what I say. When, when it came time for her to speak, I can assure you that her voice was shaky, that her heart was up in her throat, that it was racing, because she's about to expose the prime minister and say, look, this guy that you put your trust in, King, he is a traitor. He is an enemy of my people. Let me go on. Let me show you another example of great courage. It comes out of 1 Samuel. You'll know the story. It's after David had committed the sin with Bathsheba and killed Uriah. It says this in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 7. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. This is a mission that I can say this, I would not have wanted to be on. And he came unto him and he said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up and grew together with him and with his children. And it did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And it goes on. Watch your next paragraph. Nathan was sent to call out David's sin. This too would have been very difficult, but Nathan was faithful to God. Getting back to Esther, we can understand that she was definitely a woman of courage. She had promised to stand up for her people. She truly meant what she promised. There's yet another point to see here, and that is the respect that she has. I, I love just the finesse of this woman is, is amazing. Watch this. When a king asks, who is he? Her response could have been, what do you mean, who is he? What do you mean you don't know? He's been, at your, he's been by your side for quite some time after you promoted him. You gave him your ring to authorize a decree to kill my people. Many women in this situation would have belittled their husbands for missing the true character of Haman, but not Esther. She showed respect to her husband, the king. She most likely realized that he had many things to deal with as the king. There were many decrees that came across his desk. When Haman brought the decree to kill the Jews, the king signed it, and he trusted Haman. She showed respect. She could have chewed him up in that situation whenever he said, who is it? But she never did that. That wasn't her character to do that. She was focused on what was before her. There was a bigger picture. There was a bigger picture. And it was this death sentence. Watch verse 7. And the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the palace garden. Now, I, I looked around at different places. I wanted to know, why did he leave that? Why did he walk out? Why did he go out into the garden? And he's going to come back. Why did he do that? I'll, I'll give you something I think here in a moment. But watch, let me read that verse again. And the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the palace garden. 
And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther, the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Just real quick, I have a, a note here. When the king heard Esther's words concerning Haman, he stood and departed from the banquet. When the king left, Haman saw that evil was determined against him. Most likely, the king stepped out to find his executioners to carry Haman to his death. Most likely, that's what he did. Probably went out and grabbed the executioners and brought them back in. Watch verse 8. It says, Then the king returned out of the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine. And Haman, watch this, was fallen upon the bed where Esther was. Then said the king, will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, it covered Haman's face. Back to your paper. When the king returned, Haman was, had thrown himself at the feet of Esther to beg for his life. The king saw this as an attempt to seduce the queen, which only intensified the situation. I mean, it was bad enough what he's done, but now he puts an exclamation mark on it. But let me show you an interesting thought here. This is not biblical, but I, I will share it with you. A Jewish writing says that the angel Gabriel pushed Haman, so he fell on Esther's couch just as King Ahasuerus was coming back into the room to give this, um, this uh, look to the situation. This is not biblical, but it's interesting what the Jews believe happened in the situation. But anyhow, they covered Haman's faith in, face in preparation of the execution. Watch verse 9, if you would. In Harbona, this guy shows back up. One of the chamberlains said before the king, here's something the king didn't know. Behold also the gallows 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Standeth, in, yeah, in the house of Haman. And the king said, hang him there on. Watch your paper. Here it is revealed to the king that Haman had built the gallows for Mordecai, and the direct order is hang Haman on his own gallows. Notice the words of David concerning the wicked in Psalm 7, 14 through 16. Watch these words. He says, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit, and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall, shall come down upon his own pate. That's exactly what happened here. We, I told you last week or the last time, Sunday night, when we were together. What happens is the wicked many times sets the trap to catch himself, and he doesn't even realize it. And you see it in our world today, as I said Sunday night. You see the, the, a lot of the political leaders and a lot of the, the elitists and a lot of the, 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 the people that are pushing for the global agenda, and they want a global government. They want a one-world government. And what they don't realize is they will get that. Eventually, they will get that. But with that global government comes the wrath of God is exposed in, we, I read for you, Revelation chapter 6 and the sixth seal. Whenever all the elites are gathered and they cry out for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and they say, because the wrath of God has come. They know what it is. They set the trap for themselves. Watch verse 10, if you would. So they hanged Haman on the gallows. That was that spear they impaled him that he had prepared for Mordecai, then was the king's wrath pacified. There's a lot to say there, but I'm going to keep it short. Haman was executed and the king's wrath was pacified. Conclusion. I will close with the words of Solomon to remind us that there is coming a day when the unsaved wicked will be caught in their own trap. God is fully aware of their evil dealings and their traps that they set will eventually be their end proverbs chapter 1 watch this verse 10 and then 15 through 19 it says my son of sinners entice thee consent thou not my son walk not thou in the way with them refrain thy foot from their path for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood surely in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird let me tell you what that means I needed to look that up because I thought, what is, what is Solomon writing here? He's saying this, that if you spread a net out to catch birds, birds are smart enough they don't get caught up in a net. But the wicked aren't that smart. 
They spread the net, and they are the ones who get caught in it, verse 18. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Let me, let me, let me just say this, okay? Let me use what we're looking at here and bring it back into our world for a moment, and I will close with this. We look around today, and and there are a lot of things that are going on, things that are, without a doubt, completely unfair. The way people are treated, the elites are treated one way, you and I are are treated another way, and and there is not a balance, so to speak, in our world at all today. And there is such a desire by those that are in power to have more power and to have more money. To me, it makes no sense, but it seems like that's all they live for. But I guess whenever you are caught up in that stronghold, which they are caught up in, that's all you can see. And so here, some of them are, they're in their 80s, and they have more money than they can spend, and they're just constantly grabbing for more and more power and more power. And so it doesn't matter to them who they have to suppress or who they have to eliminate in order to get their power and their wealth. They just continue to do that. They continue down that path. And you and I look around, and and there are times... I know in my own life, there is a frustration that comes, is there not? There's a frustration because you see how things are completely out of balance. But I want to tell you something. Someday, someday, there will be a reckoning. There will be a reckoning. Those people that have the power will be called before God. They will stand before him. If they aren't saved, it'll be at the great white throne judgment. They will stand before him. And they will give an account for the sins that they have committed in their lives. They will then be taken and they will, they will be issued a decree of suffering according to Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 10. They will, they will be issued a, de, a decree of suffering and they will be cast in the lake of fire and they will suffer for all eternity. You and I are headed to our eternal home, to a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more injustice, none whatsoever. This is temporary. This is temporary. What those people gain here will probably be, for many of them, the only gain that they ever have. Because when they die without Christ, they will know immediately. Immediately. As we are absent from the body and present with the Lord, they will be absent from the body and present in hell. Right in the lake, right in the flames of fire is where they will go. So, what you and I have to keep in mind is this. This world is not my home. It's not my home. I don't live for what is here. Whatever I have here, I hold on to it loosely. I use it in a way that will honor and glorify God. But i got to remember that this isn't my home. And nothing that I have here am I going to take with me as far as possessions goes. Nothing. So, what I need to do with everything that I have here... I need to use it in a way that honors and glorifies God. That's what I need to do. There are times in in life, many times, and we are in that situation right now, where those that we have no power over, we surrender that to the Lord. We say, God, that's for you to work out, not for me. And our focus needs to stay right on what we are supposed to be doing. That's what it needs to be. Making sure that we share the gospel whenever we have the opportunity, that we glorify God no matter what we face in our lives. That's what we have to keep our focus on. Don't get distracted with what's out at the side. Don't do that. Don't do that. Stay focused on what we are called to do and serve the Lord in these circumstances. I listened to to an evangelist the other night He wrote a book called Urgency. I've not yet purchased it, but I would like to get the book. But he thinks that we are so, so close to the return of Jesus Christ. 
so close because of all the events, not just here, but what's going on globally, that we are so close to the return of Christ. If that's the case, and it very well may be, our time to serve is getting shorter and shorter, isn't it? I look forward to the day when hopefully in my life that call comes, whatever it is, come up hither, whatever. Might just be, hey, Keith, you're done. Come on. I'll take that call too, whatever it is. But I look forward to that. But until then, I want to keep serving until I get there. I want to keep doing all I can until I get there. Getting out as much of the truth as what I can. That's my desire. God's got something for you to do too. There's something for you to do to glorify him with whatever he's given to you. So we need to stay focused on that. Let's pray. Father, Father, we look at this chapter, chapter 7, and I'm reminded in this chapter that, Lord, that we know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. We can go back to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and we can see the end. We know that we win, so to speak, because we are in Christ. Father, just like here with Haman, Lord, there will come a day whenever all the wicked will answer for what they've done. They will stand before you at a judgment and they will answer. Lord, that's not for us to try to even to score in this life. We stand for the truth. We proclaim the truth. We stand for our liberties that we have. Lord, we do all we can. But as far as bringing the wicked to judgment, that's for you. Our responsibility is to serve you. So, Lord, help us to keep from being distracted by everything that's going on in the world. Help us to keep our focus on what you've given us to do. And continue to live for you. And proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, for that's what our world, world needs it needs the gospel. One life at a time changed, transformed. Father, take us home safely tonight. Give us, give us safe travels on the wet roads. Lord, bring us back on Sunday ready to look into your word in 1 Kings chapter 18 in the story of Elijah at Mount Carmel, dealing again with the false prophets. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You 